reading from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about people. There was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time, he refused. But finally, he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about people, this widow keeps bothering me. And I will see that she gets justice so that she won't wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Well, today's passage contains a parable that is not a simple comparison of two things that are very similar. Uh, it is what I would call a how much more story. Uh, for example, if you can get someone more quickly by riding a bicycle than by, by walking, then just think of how much faster you would be able to get there if you were able to drive. In this parable, Jesus uses two characters the likes of whom could probably be found in every village in Palestine. There was the arrogant bureaucrat who had achieved a tiny little amount of, of power and prestige and position and who thought he was better than anyone else. And then there was this woman who was powerless in that culture, but who used her tongue as if it were a sword. She had developed the art of nagging into a martial art. Uh, as I say, in all the villages of Palestine, I'm sure we had uh, both of those, those characters. Now, Jesus is not comparing God to the arrogant, insensitive, corrupt judge. But the point of this story is that if even a selfish, uncaring person can be moved to action by the persistence of the poor widow, how much more will a God who loves us be anxious to help us? In order to be sure that no one is confused by this parable, Luke literally spells it out for us in, in, in verse 1, giving us the meaning of the parable and telling us that it teaches us to pray Always, never give up, never lose heart. Jesus taught his disciples to persevere and not to give up hope just because things didn't happen quickly. Believe in God. Believe in God's love for you. Have faith. We can count on God to hear us when we pray. Obviously, when we pray, we're not sharing with God something that God didn't already know. Prayer is not advising God uh, to the recommended course of action. Rather, prayer is pouring out our hearts, knowing that God knows us, and God knows what we are feeling and experiencing. And it is this process of praying to God that can change us. Not long after the end of, of World War I, a young woman named Maria Kuchera was roaming the streets of Vienna on a Sunday afternoon. She was searching for free concerts at the uh, local cathedrals. Music was the only reason Maria would ever enter a cathedral. The country had suffered so much during the war, and then the Spanish flu that came shortly thereafter. Uh, Maria's parents had died, 
uh, when she was young and she was placed, first of all, in, in the home of, of a cousin and then with an abusive uncle. She ran away from her uncle's home when she was old enough and began to work various jobs to support herself and put herself through school. But her tragic childhood, her teen years, had left her understandably angry with life, angry with God. But this one Sunday afternoon, she settled in at a cathedral for the purpose of attending a free concert. Unfortunately, she was upset to discover that there was no concert scheduled that afternoon, and instead a, a young Jesuit priest preached a sermon. And after the service, Maria approached the priest and demanded, how can you believe all this stuff about God's goodness? His simple response was, meet me here on Tuesday at 4 p.m. Well, surprisingly enough, Maria showed up on Tuesday and began telling the priest all of the reasons why she didn't believe in God and all of the ways that God had failed her. And for more than two hours, she made accusations against God's mercy and God's existence. But strangely, the priest received her angry rant as if it were a form of confession. And he said to her, take courage. I'm going to pronounce the words. Thy sins are forgiven. And God will forgive them and forget them. And your soul will look like the soul of a newly baptized person. And when the priest prayed those words over Maria, something indeed happened in her heart. She felt as though a burden had been lifted. And it was the beginning of a journey to healing from her past. It was the beginning of returning to faith and to life. Eventually, she, she married Baron von Trapp, wrote a book that was developed into a Broadway musical that in turn became a movie. What a change in one young woman's life. Perhaps our prayers focus more on the thought of marrying a baron or making a movie, but it's what happened first, the change in her heart that allowed the other events to unfold. You can't fill your heart with, with joy and, and the sound of music when it's already filled with anger and angst. Prayer brings change in our hearts. It changes the way we, we look at others and the way we judge others. It changes the way we, we look at ourselves and, and judge ourselves. We may find ourselves feeling very resistant to the changes, the, the kind of changes that God wants to bring into our lives. The writer Frederick Buechner once wrote that this particular parable that I read a few minutes ago is just one of three that Jesus taught, emphasizing the need for persistence in prayer. In other words, it's not the time of day or whether we're kneeling or standing or if our head is bowed or looking up to heaven. It's not if our eyes are open or closed, if our hands are clasped or open to, to receive what God has for us. Persistence is the lesson. Persistence is the key. We may think of persistence in prayer as trying to beat a path to God's door, to get God to listen to us. But Buechner claims it is actually just the opposite. He says that until you have beaten the path, there may be no way for God's message to get to your door and to your heart. You may not be prepared for what God wants you to hear. Teaching perseverance 
reveals that it's, it's a process. Sometimes it's a very long process. Back in 1911, newspaper titan William Randolph Hearst offered a prize of $50,000 to the first aviator that could fly across the United States from coast to coast in less than 30 days. A young adventurer named Cal Rogers decided that he was up for the challenge and persuaded the manufacturers of Vin Fizz grape soda to underwrite his entire adventure in order to advertise their product. He purchased a plane from the Wright brothers, named it Vin Fizz after the sponsor, and then he buckled down and took a full 90 minutes of flight lessons <laughs> and chartered a train, a special train, to serve as a rolling workshop filled with spare parts to repair and maintain the, the airplane. He had a, a team of repairmen, engineers and craftsmen, and, and they would be following him step by step by step and back him up as he made his way across the country. He took off from Sheephead Bay Racetrack in Brooklyn, New York on September the 17th, and in the course of his travel, he made 75 stops and had 16 crashes. You see, what might look like a nice, smooth, grassy field from the air often hid furrows and bumps and holes and dips that could do all kinds of damage to this little plane when, when hit at 50 miles an hour. But he was ready. Bent axle, we can replace that. Crack struck, not a problem. Torn fabric, we've got reams and rolls and you know, yard after yard of the fabric we need. A broken cable, not a problem. We have it in stock. He was forced down by bad weather and mechanical failures more than 30 times. Personal injuries took longer to recover from, suffering a, a concussion in a crash at Compton, California. He spent the next three weeks recovering in a hospital. He finally arrived at his destination in Long Beach, California after 84 days on de December the 10th. Of course, he had missed the deadline. He did not win the, the cash prize, but he could claim the title as America's first transcontinental pilot. As for the plane, the Vin Fizz, the Smithsonian Institute, eventually acquired it for their Air and Space Museum in, in Washington. Uh, sort of, sort of. I say that because it had been damaged and repaired so many times in this cross-country adventure that it was said the only original parts were one of the rear rudders and the oil pan under the engine. Persistence led to transformation. And I hope that we will all be open to that same level of transformation as we prayerfully travel from the cradle to the grave. Amen.